T-I-B-E-T is what I call home. A picture I cannot visualize, but still can see the land of snow very bow. I'm trying to act carefree, but I know it's like trying to swing on a dead tree. It is a catastrophe, yet so gracefully enters the idea of Tibet being free. Tibet is my homeland, my home. I've never seen with my eyes, but always do in my dreams. So, where is home? Where is home when the connection to our lands have been severed by the colonial body known as the Chinese Communist Party? In 1949, the Chinese troops marched into our country that led to the annexation of our lands, forcing thousands and thousands of our people to take on the treacherous journey where many did not survive where many had to bury their loved ones on the way. But for the ones that did survive, it marked the beginning of our community's journey in exile. Where Tibetans came together to make sure that we took care of each other. Our communities in exile we hoped would be a short stay, but our time away from our home still continues. The struggles of our people includes being road workers, sweater sellers in the middle of the street, becoming farmers, and even serving the Indian Tutu army, all while living in refugee settlement camps, finding a way to not only survive, but thrive in our new communities and our new shared environments. All of this was possible because of the visionary leadership of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama and our ancestors, who together worked so hard to build a democratic government in exile, known as the CTA the central Tibetan administration that is governed by its constitution and held together by three pillars, the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive, Kasha. Today, the CTA enables us to practice our democratic right to elect our leader, Sikyong, the official leader of the Tibetans, every five years across 30 free countries. Now that's what I call democracy in action without borders. Yet, in every corner of the world, Tibetans are reminded of how we have been denied our connection to our land, to our people, and our identity. And hence, everywhere we go, our mere existence becomes resistance. We come together, no matter what we're doing, we live our complex lives, but there's always another truth that is lingering at the back of our heads. And that is life inside of Tibet. Where the Tibetan plateau is melting three times faster than the rest of the world, where Tibetan nomads, millions of them, have been displaced from their natural habitat into colonial blocks that are concrete. Right now, as I speak, Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet, is entering over a 50-day lockdown with China's zero COVID policies, where people have been in forced quarantine, even if you're not positive, and being starved. People have risked their lives to send me text messages and Folks in exile videos for you to be able to see, for the international community to respond to their calls to action and for support. Yes, COVID lockdowns are happening all around the world, but 
when they're in addition to constant surveillance, when 80% of your children are being forced or coerced into colonial state-run boarding schools, children as young as three years old who are not able to return home. In addition to that, we've heard of millions of Tibetans being forced to give their DNA and blood samples. That is genocide. It is intentional erasure of our identity and our people. Despite all of this turmoil and hardships, Tibetans inside of Tibet continue to rise. One of the ways is Lakar, a homegrown movement that began inside of Tibet as a means to preserve their culture by eating, speaking, wearing, supporting Tibetan local businesses every Wednesday, because that's the auspicious day of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in a week. Now, Lakar has spread into exile all across the world, where we too eat, speak, wear Tibetan, and also dance Tibetan Gorshe. That is the spirit of solidarity. If Tibetans inside of Tibet can do that, why shouldn't we? Plakar is just one example of how we thrive. Thanks to the work of our ancestors who thought about us and sacrificed all that they did. Now, it's our turn. It's our turn to think and build for the next generations to come, to pass on the baton to the next champions of change. I come from three generations of statelessness, but I stand here in front of you all with the spirit of my ancestors and the spirit of Tibetans inside of Tibet to tell you I'm currently running for office in Toronto running to become the next city councillor of Parkdale High Park. Millions of causes and conditions had to come together for this moment to fruition, just like how our liberations are interdependent. We live in an interconnected world where there are 89 million people or more that have been forcibly displaced in this world. And that number is only bound to rise because of climate change. Just take a second and think about the loss. How many are going to be severed from their lands and their people? We must come together and strive for a better future, because thriving is only possible when we come together in collaboration and coalitions to fight for our collective liberation. It is us who come together to make sure that we are showing up, calling on each other to show up. So show up for Tibet call for one, open and unfettered access to Tibet. Two, independent investigation of millions of Tibetans that have been forced to give their DNA and blood samples. Three, demand the closure of the colonial state-run boarding schools now. So, where is home? There's a Tibetan saying, home is where you are happy. And whoever is kind to you are like your parents. I've come to learn that my home is not just the picture I visualize of Tibet. It's where my parents, my teachers, and mentors are. It's also Parkdale High Park. It's also on this stage right here with you all, with our shared humanity, where we unite in our struggles to fight for our homes, wherever that may be, and where every single one of us is free. Pergello. <laughs>